So I have a question. How can we as a society mitigate climate change and create a sustainable future for generations to come? I asked myself this same question 10 years ago roaming the halls of this very institution. Misuse, overuse, greed, gluttony, and selfishness have taken a huge toll on the natural resources of our planet. Forests are being cleared at a phenomenal rate to make way for livestock operations, monocultures, and urban developments. Climate change is real, and there's no getting away from it. The question is, can we do anything about it? I won't get into the statistics on climate change, as Al Gore is a much better expert on the subject than I am. As an ecologist, I've learned that in order to understand how the natural system works, we need to look at things from a systems approach. And to solve these problems, we need to understand that we live in a complex ecosystem with all the other organisms in this world. And it turns out that the answer to climate change might be right under our feet. Unfathomable numbers of microbes working in various facets in ecological roles. So with climate change, the question is, can we do anything to reverse it? And I think the answer is yes, and it lies in soil biology. Microbes do a lot of things in this world. They cause disease, they cure disease, they help plants grow, they help animals grow, and they sequester organic carbon from the atmosphere into the soil. So where do we start? The first place we start is looking at organics waste management. Many municipalities across the world have begun to use composting as a way to divert waste from landfills. But food processing plants really haven't come that far yet. So the question is, how can we help food processing plants manage their waste in a much better fashion? So let's face it, food proce processed food is never going away. As much as we say eat local and source local, most ordinary folks don't have the wherewithal or time to shop in this fashion. So by understanding this, we can work with food processors to manage their waste a lot more effectively. As you can see from this picture, it takes a phenomenal amount of energy to process and package food. As such, food processors are actually one of the largest emitters of carbon on the planet. So in order to help them reverse this, new regulations on emissions and organics waste regulations are coming into the equation. Food processors, through regulations, are starting to understand that they need to change the way that they manage their systems. As such, a lot of food processors are starting to manage their wastewater a lot more effectively by using it through an anaerobic process, anaerobic digestion, to create methane gas to heat their plants. In this way, they can actually mitigate a lot of the carbon that's given off through coal generation. Another way they can do it is by, again, diverting waste from landfill, landfills, land applying their raw wastes, and actually feeding it to animals. Livestock is actually one of the largest carbon emitters on the planet. So the problem with applying waste in a raw form back to the land is that it's volatile. A lot of the organic matter is actually, and nutrients, are gassed off into the atmosphere or leached out into the soil. So we need to change the way that we're doing this. And in order to do that, we have to look at compost and the power of microbes. So in 2014, I was sitting at my desk and I got a call from the environmental manager at Simplot Canada, Femi Ferreira. And he posed a question to me. He said, we have a bunch of waste at our facility and we were wondering if your organization can help us compost it. And I thought to myself, I think so, but I didn't understand enough about the potato processing process in order to make an answer. So I said, you know, let's set up a meeting. I'll come up and have a tour of your facility and we'll go from there. So I went out to the facility and it turns out that this plant processes 600 million pounds of potatoes on an annual basis, of which 8% becomes waste. There are three types of waste that they produce. One is the soil that's washed off the potatoes as it goes through the washing cycle. It's run through a massive centrifuge and the waste, and the waste is pressed through a belt filter press, and basically you have topsoil. The second waste is when the trucks come in and dump the potatoes on the floor. The potatoes that don't fit the bill fall through the grate and all the soil and other things as well. So that's the second type of waste. The third type of waste is actually cut potatoes and french fries and peels. 
which represents by far the majority. Now, looking at this, I thought, can we do anything? I went back to my office and I scoured the scientific literature and it turns out that nobody's doing this. This is like a brand new idea. Nobody's ever tried to compost this waste on such a scale. So we decided that we were gonna run a pilot on the project. And we partnered with a local landfill, Steinbach Landfill, and we set up a, a project to run a compost pilot. Now, in order to compost, you need a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 25 to one or 35 to one, between that range. And it turns out that the potato waste that we were looking at was about 18 to one. So we needed to source some other waste products. So it turns out that we have a local racetrack here that's been stockpiling uh, straw and manure for about 25 years. So they've got about 15,000 tons of the stuff lying around. And they said we could use some of that waste to run our pilot. However, there was too much carbon now, so we needed to get some nitrogen to bring back into the system. So we went to uh, a local feed production company, Master Feeds, who produces feed for swine, cattle, uh, egg-laying chickens, and things of that nature. And they have produced a large amount of waste from bin blowouts and off-spec material. So if you take a look at the picture on the left-hand side, that's actually the, the manure and straw from the horse track the waste feed from Master Feeds, and then on the right-hand side, you'll see that this is the potato waste from one day at, Mas at J.R. Simplot. Then what we do is we take that material and we turn it and add water. Compost is a microbial process, so in order to make a good product, you need to intensively manage it. So in 90 days, we can take this material from a raw state into a beautiful finished compost. <coughs> It turns out, sorry, it turns out that we tested nine different recipes and one of them turned out to be a really fantastic compost product. So we thought, well, we can do this and we can do it on a large scale. So let's work on it, which created a big challenge. You know, you need an industrial site to be able to do this type of work. Serendipitously, uh, there was a 240 acre industrial site not far from the Steinbach landfill that believe it or not, actually had a four acre registered compost pad site on it. So with a little bit of diligence, we contacted the owners and we started the negotiations to purchase this site. And in July of 2015, we, we purchased it. And on the left hand side, you can see this is what the facility looked like in July. Uh, as of yesterday, you'll see on the right hand side what it looks like. We've got 31 windrows, We've processed 15,000 tons of waste, and we've generated about 7,500 tons of high-value climate-changing compost. That's our uh, compost manager, Jerry, having a look at the, the compost. It smells beautiful. There's, there's absolutely no odors in the finished product, and it's, it's a beautiful, uh, nutrient-rich compost. So in order to maintain the level of production that we required, we actually have to source a lot more carbon because there's just so much waste being generated on a daily basis. So we looked to a local forestry operation to get some wood chips and we've also sourced some straw from a local straw processing plant. Compost is a microbially driven process and the power of microbes is absolutely incredible. If you take a look here in this photograph, you'll see that this is our turner yesterday morning on a pile that was two weeks old. As it goes into the pile about three feet, you can start to see the steam and the heat generation from this process. At seven feet, you can no longer even see the turner. That's how powerful these microbes are. The energy that they generate is phenomenal. Now, this heating phase only lasts for about two weeks, and then the compost cools down. So during that heating phase, you actually see carbon being emitted. So you'll see carbon dioxide, methane, and uh, nitrogen gases being emitted through the composting process. However, when you actually return that compost back to the land, you end up sequestering a lot more compost through various mechanisms. The first is avoided fertilizer use. Because compost is actually a fertilizer, you don't need to use as much in your crops. So you, you see major reductions in fertility. The second is <clears throat> pesticides. 
good compost is actually disease suppressive. So you can really work to reduce your pesticide and fungicide applications by taking care of your soil. The third is humus production. Humus production, according to Graham Sait, who did a wonderful TED talk on humus for climate change, is the largest source of carbon sequestration on the planet. And it turns out that the soil outside of the ocean is the largest carbon sink in the world. So if we can actually increase the soil productivity in our agricultural lands, we can start to mitigate and actually change climate. And this has major ramifications. And believe it or not, there is enough waste being generated by all of the people around the world, all of the food processors around the world, to actually do this. And ultimately, it takes a lot of hard work, a dedicated team, and a lot of risk to do it. Setting up a compost facility is not cheap. It's a very expensive and capital-intensive endeavor. But at the end of the day, those costs are nothing compared to what you can actually save when you start to look at the socioeconomic benefits of this type of an operation. So now that we've got a few months under our belt, we've actually been approached by uh, another company, McCain Foods. Uh, they got wind that we were uh, doing this waste management program with Simplot and they asked if we would be interested in doing something with them as well. So we said yes, but this time we took a little bit of a different spin. We went through the heating phase of the compost, through that thermophilic phase, and then once it cooled down, we put a phenomenal amount of worms into this pile. And worms can transform organic matter way faster and way more energy efficiently than we can with a compost turner. And they also create a much higher nutrient value because it's not steaming off, right? So a lot of that nutrients is actually stay, stays within the, the, the product. So the future of our society really depends on how we manage our wastes moving forward. And I believe that compost and vermi technology are the future. And they do so much more. I'll give you an example. Worms are like little bioreactors. We actually have one of the largest worm farms uh, in North America. And they contain a phenomenal amount of bacteria in their castings, about 10 billion bacteria per gram. And if you can create the right environment, these worms can create large populations of plant beneficial organisms. Using this type of technology, we can actually work to eliminate and reduce hydrocarbon-based fertilizers and fungicides. Today, we've got over 300 customers across the country. We're working with 90 golf courses, multiple municipalities, and we've got about 15,000 acres of farms uh, on our program. So it all comes down to creating value from waste. So this, uh, this photograph back here is, is from Dr. Sally Brown, a professor at the University of Washington in Washington State. And she has been a real champion uh, on climate change and using compost to, to help change climate. And her team came up with a, a greenhouse gas emissions mo model for the Canadian government that allows waste managers to take a look at the different waste streams that they've got access to and how that actually works to uh, sequester carbon over time. And it turns out that no matter what you're doing, if you're making compost and you land apply it, you're helping to change the climate. And it doesn't happen immediately, it happens over time. So the more compost we can make from organic wastes, the more we can help to mitigate climate change. And I really think that we need to take way more action, we need to talk less, take more action, People need to realize that we need government regulations and incentives so that we can realistically create these compost facilities in a cost-effective fashion so that this kind of process can be used on a global scale. And I think that we're leaders in the industry and our model is scalable and can be done anywhere. Anywhere you create organic waste, you can create compost and you can return the resources back to the earth. And I think that as long as there's people that are willing to stick their neck out on the line and you have a good team of dedicated people to do the work, we can change the climate. 
And the answer all lies in biology. So that's basically my talk. And I really think that, uh, you know, the time is now to change. We can change the climate and we can secure the earth for future generations to come. So thank you very much. And that's all I have to say.